our reading will come from Luke 24, verse 13 to 35. Um, so it reads um, um, the, the Emmaus disciples. Um, so now, <clears throat> the, same, the same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together they were discussing everything uh, that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. Then um, he asked them, what is this dispute that you are having with each other as you, as you are walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. The one, of, <clears throat> the one named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem um, who doesn't know the things that happened in uh, that happened there in these days? What things he asked them? So they said to him, the things concerning uh, Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and um, all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides, uh, besides all this, it's the third day since these things had happened. Moreover, some of them, um, some, 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 moreover, some women, women um, from our group astounded us. They arrived uh, at the tomb, and they, they didn't find his body. They came and reported that they had seen a vision um, of angels who, of, of angels who said he was alive. Some of, <clears throat> some, some of those who, who were with us um, went to the tomb and found that it was just the, uh, as the women had said, but they didn't see him. He said to them, how foolish and slow you are to believe all of the prophets uh, who have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer all of these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning um, Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted uh, for them the things concerning um, the self in this, himself in, in all of the scriptures. They came near the village where they were going, and he gave an impression that he was going further, but, he argue, but they urged him, stay with us because <clears throat> almost, uh, it's almost evening, and now the day is almost over. So he went into, to stay with them, and it was as he reclined at the table with them, and he took uh, the bread, blessed, and broke it, and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That very hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found, <clears throat> they found the eleven, and those with them gathered together, who said, the Lord has truly uh, been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then uh, they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he had made known to all of them the breaking uh, of the bread. Uh, this is the reading of God's word. Thank you. I think it's, it, we should practice something new, mate. Uh, you did uh, uh, take my greeting this morning, so I will uh, move past that swiftly. But I think when we, when we do come together to read God, God's word, I think when, when the person reading uh, ends of reading, I think we should all come together and say praise be to God in response of uh, this wonderful, wonderful word that we would be engaging on or hearing. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Lisejo. Um, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City, uh, and this morning uh, to open God's word. Um, as Reino introduced me uh, a little bit earlier on, um, I am one of the elders sent with Reino as a plurality of elders to plant Fellowship City. Um, what you don't know is that we spend lots of time on the phone, lots of late night meetings. Uh, should I move a little bit? Is that better? What you don't know is that we spend a lot of time uh, speaking, uh, uh, praying, thinking through what God would have us do, um, and some of the things that he mentioned is a great joy that we'll be having a marriage course, that we have other courses within the year that would go towards building the church of God. So as I said, this morning we're starting a new series. Um, we just come out of Easter. Um, we had resurrection celebrations last week. Um, we enjoyed some muffins. If you weren't here, 
you are missing a treat if you don't come. <laughs> they were called the resurrection muffins, but, but they were just normal ingredients. They were really good, really good. <laughs> they were very high. Okay. <laughs> so coming out of r- the resurrection celebrations, uh, coming out of Easter, we are trying to respond to that through this new series. We're trying to look at what the resurrection as a way of life means, what the resurrection should mean and how we should respond to the resurrection. And that is why we're starting this series. So resurrection, uh, what that means and how we ought to respond to that. Um, as we've just looked at that. We're going to do that this morning, looking at Luke chapter 24. Um, This is coming right out of that period of time. I'm going to first build the context of how we get to Luke 24. And then after that, I'm going to look at three things, so three headings, false impressions, promises, and what the resurrection means. And you saw some of the words as we were reading the text. They will start to come alive as we get there. So we're going to look at three things after building the context. We're going to look at false impressions, we're going to look at promises, and what the resurrection means. So we will come to see the false impressions that were prevalent during that time, during the first resurrection, that's how we should view it, during the first resurrection, what the the false impressions were, uh, maybe even today, that some of those false impressions might still exist. And we'll be reminded of the promises of God and what the right impression ought to be, what the right expectation ought to be. And then ultimately, let's respond to that. Let me pray for us before we get into God's word. Thank you, Lord, that this morning we can come together to hear from your word. We pray that you would remove all the distractions, help us to focus on you. We pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to us, would challenge us, and would share with us those things that you'd want us to know, say, and do, and that a meditation of our hearts would be pleased with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 24 is after Jesus was betrayed, after he was resurrected, deserted, mocked, and judged. Jesus Christ was given the crown of thorns. He held a cross, he carried it, and there's a cross that he was crucified on. At noon, darkness comes over the land and the curtain of the sanctuary is torn. We saw some of the words as we were singing forever as well. Jesus breathes his last breath. His body is removed from the cross and wrapped in fine linen and placed in a tomb. A stone is then rolled in front of this tomb. Before he was crucified, we understand that the woman there, there were women there that come from Galilee that were with him. And they've seen the stone now, and they come back three days later, and they find something quite unexpected. The stone is rolled away. And more importantly, that Jesus is not there. They find that Jesus is not there. The women then see angels. The women see angels. That's what verse 5 says. And verse 5 says, and this is part of chapter 24. We only read 30, 13 to 25 because that's the main text we're looking at. But to understand the context of what we're looking at this morning, verse 5 says, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. That's what verse 5 says. And the angels remind the woman of the words of Jesus. It is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. The women leave the tomb and share the news with others. And Peter, upon hearing this news, rushes to see and confirm what he's just heard. And when he gets there, he too is surprised that Jesus is not there. He is risen. So let's look at our first point, first false impression. So Luke introduces us to two individuals. In verses 13, one named Cleopas, but both these individuals were in Jerusalem and are likely to be among those that, that hear about the empty tomb, likely, among to be those, uh, likely to be among those that hear about the stone being rolled away 
and no body of Jesus. So now they're on their way, leaving Jerusalem. And as they leave, they're discussing the events of the last few days. It even says arguing. So they, they, they discussing, arguing about what has happened in the last few days. But they interrupt it. Or surprised to see Jesus, but they don't recognize him. So they see someone who's now supposedly walking with them and speaking to them and asking them a question. And the question is, what is this dispute that you are having with each other as you walk? What is this dispute that you're having with each other as you are walking? So they don't recognize Jesus. They just see someone walking with them. And they find this question very surprising. So much so that the Bible says that they stopped and looked discouraged. Can you imagine that? That's how mind-blowing the question is to them. It's like asking if Bafana Bafana would be playing in the World Cup. <laughs> it's, surely you know this. <laughs> or, or it's like asking who has been banned from the Oscar. <laughs> so, so they stopped and looked discouraged because the only thing that is being talked about by everyone, the talk of the town, is the resurrection in the last few days, his death and his resurrection. That is the talk. So people are talking about what happened throughout this period. So this was a week of controversy, a week of political influence. If you think of Jesus having been arrested, standing before Pilate, then Herod, then Pilate. And Pilate responds to the chief priests and crowds and says, this man has done nothing wrong. I'm not going to hold this man. But the crowds and chief priests want Barnabas released instead. Can you imagine that? Barnabas released instead. A murderer instead of someone who's done nothing wrong. So that's what, what is also being talked about is the empty tomb three days later. Right? Um, but there's also no confirmation from the Romans and the Jewish council about what happened. So that's the talk. All of this is why they were perplexed about this question. What are you talking about? So then Cleopas in verse 18 asks a question as well. Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? What things, he asked. <laughs> so they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since all these things happened. So last week, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but if we look deeper at Luke 24, we can see a very different uh, response or appreciation or understanding to the resurrection, to what we had, which was joyous and celebratory. They don't seem to be very joyous, maybe rather com confused, disappointed, saddened. What is important to note is that the source of their disappointment includes what they hoped and believed, which they didn't think happened, but it did. They hoped that Jesus would be the one who redeems Israel. They had a different picture of how this redemption would be realized. They had a wrong impression or unmet expectation, which related to how Jesus would redeem his people. Think about where they come from, likely leaving everything to walk and live with Jesus, to be disciples of Jesus, and to see the expectations that had been building up not happen in the way that they expected. They're expecting to see Jesus come to rule, but they don't experience it in the same way. He has come to rule, they just don't see it yet. So we share some false impressions or first impressions of situations or interactions that we had previously seen, some of which were disappointing, some made us sad, maybe a little bit confused. Um, maybe like a new supporter of Manchester United or Arsenal would constantly believe there is joy coming. <laughs> but there is no joy, really, is there? Or having been employed, saddened and confused to see your pay slip and your new best mate share in your salary. Best mate being the tax man here. I, and I've always wanted to ask him to journey with me as we go to negotiate for the salary so he can ask for his portion 
and that we can have cordial relationships after. Or maybe saddened by giving the petrol attendant a 200 rand note to put some petrol in. The needle moves the opposite direction. <laughs> or opening a new packet of crisp potato chips. Your favorite Lay's or Simba, and the packet is yet again shrunk. <laughs> or trying by your own strength, basically pulling up your bootstraps to overcome sin in your life by your own strength. And then you keep stuck in that sin because you're not making Jesus the source of your strength. Or coming to Jesus only as healer, provider, and not savior. He does heal, he does provide. But primarily he's here to save. So you may be surprised like the two individuals. Because even though he is healer and provider, primarily he's here to save us. So the two individuals in Luke 24, through the confusion and disappointment, don't see that the subject or the main character in their perceived disappointment is walking right next to them. They don't recognize Jesus. They had heard Jesus teach. They had seen him perform miracles. They were with him. They believed him. But they don't recognize him. They didn't know what to think about the events of the last three days. Jesus says to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. From Jesus' response, we get that sense or that same bit of frustration as a parent who is maybe teaching a child, but they don't get it. They have been learning, they've been reading the Torah, but maybe not listening or reading carefully because they don't see the patterns. They don't see that the one God promised to send would save them through suffering. The Old Testament is full of these patterns that speak to this point. And you see the very first one, we see it, the very first pattern we see in Genesis. We see when God says the serpent would bruise his heel, but he would be victorious putting an end to evil and death. This is the first mention of offspring from Eve. So there is suffering and there is victory. We see Jesus then continue to unpack these things concerning himself and Old Testament patterns, words from the prophets. That's what he's doing when he's walking with these two, explaining suffering and victory to the two individuals. Luke is is not very prescriptive about exactly what he shares, But perhaps he continued to Genesis 22. Perhaps he spoke about the picture of a father's sacrifice that we see uh, of Abraham preparing to sacrifice Isaac, his beloved son. So picture of suffering, picture of sacrifice. Perhaps he continued on to Joseph uh, and drew the picture of his continued downward spiral of suffering and slavery and imprisonment with ultimate exaltation to power and saving the world. Or or perhaps he he continued through Exodus, um, through Leviticus, through the systems of sacrifice. Perhaps through David, who described his own suffering and exaltation that went through and beyond his experience only, but that to his greater son. So perhaps he's explaining these things to them, and they would see as he's explaining that there's a pattern. There's an obvious order, one of suffering and glory. It is everywhere in the Old Testament. We see the need of Jesus who is to come to save. We see suffering precedes glory, humiliation precedes exaltation. Jesus fixes the expectations, the impressions of his death and the empty tomb is to be one of great joy. Understanding that the promise of conquering death and evil was complete in his resurrection. That is the victory. That is the conquering. So they urge Jesus then to not continue on his way, but to stay with them as it's getting late. Jesus agrees, and let's look at what happens next from verse 30. Verse 30 says, It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. 
this whole week as I'm reading this, I get goosebumps on this. It's, so verse 30 and 31 raises an interesting question. Why were they not able to recognize Jesus? Or kept from recognizing Jesus? That's a great question. I think we can find the answer in verses 25. So verse 25 says, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? So they can see that they're walking with a man, but they can't recognize that this man is Jesus. Their spiritual and physical eyes are closed. Jesus calls them foolish and slow to believe. So their outward inability to recognize Jesus mirrored their inward unbelief of what the scriptures revealed about him. So their outward inability to recognize Jesus mirrored their inward unbelief of what the scriptures revealed about him. It's clear that Jesus intended to help them see him and how he helps their inward unbelief first by unpacking scripture about himself. So he's targeting their inward unbelief first. He helps them walk by faith and not by sight. Like many generations to come who would not have the ability to see Jesus, but would have the ability to hear and walk by faith. So those in generations to come would not have the benefit of seeing Jesus, of touching the holes in his hands, in his resurrection body, seeing his resurrected body. Those in generations to come, including ourselves, would know Jesus through the inerrancy of scripture and the words of others who believe. So we have the whole, te- the whole Old Testament which prepares us to understand the suffering and glory of Jesus. The New Testament to expand our understanding of who Jesus is. Let's read verse 31 again. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. The two finally see Jesus. What should be interesting is what happened before they physically were able to see Jesus. Jesus is reclining at the table and he took the bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Doesn't this sound familiar? Doesn't this sound familiar? Luke 22, a few chapters before, at the Passover meal, again Jesus is reclining, he takes the cup, gives thanks and gives it to them. Verse 19, and he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them, and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is when their eyes are opened and they see Jesus, the same Jesus who gave the symbols at Passover of his body that would be broken for them. How amazing is that? That they're seeing this again. Can you imagine the goosebumps that they feel that this is what happened at the Passover? And this, is what, this is exactly what he meant. And their eyes opening and them physically being able to see Jesus after their inward unbelief is quelled. When they understand this, his body is broken for them, the scandal of the cross, that Jesus does something to forgive his enemy, which is us. We're his enemy. We rebel against him, but he forgives us. He dies for us and makes us his. You can imagine as they come to understand this, as they come to remember the Passover meal, as they come to see this picture developing of who Jesus really is, the one who came to save them. The penny drops. And at that moment, Jesus disappears. So let's look at verse 32. They said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? Weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us. Their hearts were burning within them as Jesus was talking with them, explaining the scriptures, as Jesus was putting himself front and center where he should be, where he belongs. The two are transformed through an encounter with Jesus. And that encounter is primarily through the words of his prophets and the words about Jesus. They're transformed through the understanding that Jesus is not dead, that he is resurrected. That's why they can't see his body, that he is resurrected. 
that because he is resurrected, that he has conquered death. They did not necessarily get a Jesus they want, but rather a Jesus they need. And that is why some of their unbelief might have shaped them in a particular direction. They wanted to see Jesus overthrow the government. They wanted to see him act in power in a certain way. But that's not necessarily the one that they needed. They needed a savior, Jesus. So D.A. Carson says this, if God had perceived that our greatest need was economic, he would have sent an economist. If it was entertainment, he would have sent us a comedian or an artist. If it was political stability, he would have sent us a politician. If it was health, he would have sent us a doctor. But he perceived that our greatest need involved our sin, our alienation from him, our profound rebellion, our death, and he sent us a savior. Their hearts were set on fire by meeting the savior, by coming to understand that they don't, that all these other things that they need or they thought was not front and center. What was front and center is their need for a savior, Jesus. And their hearts were set on fire. Because that's what he was sharing with them as he's walking. He's sharing them the things about himself, concerning himself, spoken about the prom- the, spoken by the prophets. So these are the promises that they would have been hearing about this one who's to come. He's explaining these things, and that is what sets their hearts on fire. Meeting the Savior Jesus. So how did the setting of fire in their hearts change the two? How did it change them? The resurrection changed their lives. Understanding that God defeated death for them, understanding that God defeated death for you, for me. Without the death and resurrection, there is no life. There is no vision for the future. There is no purpose. The resurrection became their new life. Immediately they got up and went back to Jerusalem. The conviction sets in. It was late, remember, it was late. They asked Jesus to not continue on his way to come with them, but immediately they got up. That's the conviction. They got up and returned to Jerusalem. The penny drops of who, the penny drops on, on who Jesus is, the King, the Messiah, the one foretold, the one who conquered death, the one who saves. And they change and go to Jerusalem to go share this gospel, to go share this news. The conviction is set in, the hearts are on fire. So what should the resurrection as a way of life mean to us? conviction for the truth in the resurrection. If we believe that this resurrection is true as we see on the pages of scripture, we should see that as part of the cornerstone of what we believe, the resurrection. Nothing holds together without it. His promises are for you and for me. That's what it means. His promises through his death, his promises through his resurrection. This is where our hope lies promises that he came to save us and to forgive our sins. So when you can't see the light in your situation, be reminded of Jesus and his body that was broken for you. So if you can't see the light in your struggle with sin, if you can't see the light in your marriage, in your work, if you can't see the light in your family struggles and in your relationships, be reminded how he is the fulfillment of his promises. He has conquered evil and defeated death. We live in a broken and fallen world. We will face hardship, but through that, we must posture and look towards the cross. Be reminded of the cross. He will restore. So Peter in Acts 3 verse 19 to 21 says, Repent therefore and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Jesus will return and restore everything. We live in a broken world and we would have seen that and experienced this in many ways. Over the last year, we would have seen from the looting or from covid even the recent nature and destruction in KZN, that we live in a world that is broken. When he returns and restores, the world will be rid of sin and the consequences of a broken world. We should be reminded of this. As we live with the effects of this broken world, through personal sickness, through broken hearts, 
loss of income, we must remain hopeful that he has kept his promises before. That he came, that he died, was resurrected. And that he will return and will restore. Sin is crouching at your door, but God can really set you free. Jesus rose to prove that we can really be saved from sin. We don't deserve salvation, but he freely gives it to us. All we need to do is, as Peter says, repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you. It does not matter the sin you're struggling with, whether it's lust, anger, idols, before God. Repent, turn back, and your sins are blotted out and forgiven. When we're tempted to doubt his word, to lose faith, and hope, as you may have lost sight of him, like the two individuals in Luke 24. It doesn't mean that he isn't there walking with us. We may just not be able to see him, like they were not able to recognize him. So those times when we, we feel we don't have this hope, when we feel that we're losing our sight, we can't see him, those are the times we need to spend in God's word. We need to spend time stuck in the word of God, not, ne not neglecting it. We need to spend those times looking for community, not avoiding it. And as we do that, we will begin to recover our sight. If we spend every moment possible looking at the word of God and seeking his people, we will re recover our sight in the midst of whatever is happening. We need to spend time finding Jesus more and more in the Bible, reading it, consuming it seeing the patterns and continually being convicted. Through this continuous conviction, we can find hope in whatever situation. We can be transformed to be more and more like Jesus. Jesus spoke through the Torah about, and about what, what it says about him, so you too can have your hearts transformed and set on fire through reading his word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that um, your word is true and that we can see through the pages of scripture that you're a God who does not lie, who keeps his promises, that you have made a way for us to fix our relationship with you, to cause us to no longer be alienated from you, but to draw us nearer to you, to give us life, to give us hope give us faith, to give us vision for the future that is in you and your eternal life. Help us whenever we lose sight of where you are to remember that you're walking next to us, that you're walking with us. Help us that we don't, when we lose hope, when we lose faith, when we lose sight, to look for it in your word, to find community, find brothers and sisters around us who can point us to the cross of Christ and remind us of your promises. I pray that this morning that you would continue to speak to us, challenge us, correct us, rebuke us where we need rebuking through your Holy Spirit and point us to the cross of Christ that we may be encouraged, that our faith and hope may be built up in knowing that you, Lord, came to save us, to build a relationship with us. Help us to live lives that mirror that. Help our hearts to be set on fire and the result of that, to live lives that reflect that. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.